Okay, so this is going to be a primer covering um, some concepts and uh, different technologies in 3D printing, uh, along with some modeling techniques in rhinoceros that you can use to essentially more effectively engage in that, that process. Okay, uh, and so the first thing you need to think about as you go through this is you want to think water balloon. And the reason why you want to think water balloon, uh, you need to have a watertight object um, is the really the key concept here. Um, and that's really going to be defined by having a distinct interior and a distinct exterior. Uh, so if you think of uh, the vessel of a water balloon, you have water on the inside, one on the outside. Uh, and if you don't pay attention to that, what ends up happening is uh, you can have the water balloon sort of exploding, right? Uh, and you have a big mess is essentially uh, the idea here that you want to pay attention to. So if you don't have that um, that distinct interior and that distinct exterior, you won't have a watertight object. Uh, you won't have an enclosed volume that you can then print. All right, and so uh, 3D printing really, um, this is just uh, really high, uh, low level stuff here. Um, is a method for fabrication that takes digital objects through additive processes, constructs a physical version of the object. Um, obviously, that makes it distinct because it's an additive process. Um, subtractive processes uh, like CNC milling, laser cutting, water jet cutting, etc., um, are sculpting out of um, a block of raw material. Um, so this is starting to look at this initially um, for one-off prototyping at a scale. Um, Nike's engaging this uh, in the prototyping of their own shoes. Um, you can start to see some research into um, using some definitions in Grasshopper, uh, where we can start to thicken places, uh, parts of geometry where you might, like for in the instance of a cast here, I want to thicken that up and uh, basically reinforce those areas. Um, 3D printing is moving into um, uh, organs. I think they just 3D printed their first liver um, a few weeks ago. Um, uh, obviously, we can do um, augmentation. I just really like this image just because it's uh, very grotesque uh, and it's it's sort of disgusting, but uh, it's a really, really functional component to, to how you might use 3D printing. And obviously, you can use it uh, for prosthetics. Uh, and also, the first time this was done, they had 3D printed their first room. Um, and I believe this was done in ETH Zurich. Um, but you can see, like, this is... Uh, it's starting to scale up, so you can start to imagine this possibly happening at the scale of architecture not too, in the not-too-distant future. All right, so then the processes that we're going to look at, um, the first is um, fused deposition modeling uh, that es essentially uses uh, ABS plastic, PLA plastic, um, to and it, it's squirted out, and the way that I uh, generally explain this to my students is it's basically like a tube of toothpaste um, that's very thin that's getting heated and squirting that out into layers. Um, and you can see uh, an image that this is just pulled off of um, uh, the Wikipedia sites here uh, online. Um, but and you can see the diagram here where it's, you have a, a nozzle uh, that is extruding that out uh, onto a plate. This comes in a, a variety of different colors and a variety of different materials. Uh, one thing you need to pay attention to when you're doing this is that uh, if you're not specifically engaging uh, and paying attention to the material that you're using and making sure that it's appropriate for your machine, um, you're going to get a lot of fuzzy, crappy models out of, uh, especially out of those desktop 3D printers. Um, so you have Uprint. Uh, this is uh, Dimension. They have a lot of really nice. Um, 3D printers, you get a um, very, very low failure rate when you get into the higher end machines in it versus the desktop printers, which tend to be sort of all over the place. Um, that runs through Catalyst. Um, a lot of the softwares, um, or sorry, a lot of the softwares will uh, set up, and I think Microsoft is actually get into the, getting into the production of 3D printing technology for that. Uh, and so here's an overview of what you might see in a desktop 3D printer. There's a couple things you want to pay attention to when you're looking at this. Um, you really want to make sure you have um, a heated plate um, that's going to enable the um, material to stay adhered to the um, build envelope while it's actually blaring that up and building that out. Um, in addition to that, uh, if you can get a build uh, heated chamber, that will also assist in sort of um, enabling control of how the material will cool. Uh, and the reason why you want to control that is uh, ABS plastic um, expands significantly when it's heated. And so um, as it cools, if you don't have, aren't in control of that, uh, the model can start to rip itself apart or pull itself off of the plate, uh, sorry, off of the build plate. Uh, and so you really want to pay attention to that. So here's some examples of some of my student work that, that came off of this. That's a just an ABS. That's off of uh, Uprint. That's what we have at K-State. So, All right. And uh, like you can start to see where this can start to go. Um, the nice thing about this is um, ABS plastic is a lot of the plastic is translucent. So you can use it for lighting. Because it's plastic, you're not going to explode. Um, 
Alternatively, you can use PLA, uh, polylactite plastic. Um, this stuff is bio, uh, where the, I'm not going to pronounce all each one of those words. Um, essentially, what you need to know is each one of those things on its own is cancerous. Um, so you don't want to eat this stuff. It's not food safe. Um, and uh, all, I think it becomes really toxic um, at about 200 degrees. So you can handle it, but I, I wouldn't recommend putting it against your body. Um, it's just not good practice. Uh, the PLA plastic, though, uh, is biodegradable. Uh, the models do decay, I've found, uh, relatively quickly. I'm not sure if that's by ultraviolet light, um, but I, they become more fragile um, pretty quickly over time. Uh, and so the way that this breaks down, uh, you guys are probably reading this as I'm going through it. Um, there's a low vertical resolution on this, um, a DPI of 100. You can, if the models sit in front of you from across the room, you can usually see the layers and the stepping. Um, so it's not a relatively very, not a relatively high quality model coming out of that. But they are strong and they are flexible. So if you knock it off the table, it's not going to explode and break apart. You usually can withstand that kind of impact. So um, the cost of this is obviously coming down. You can get one at Best Buy now for, uh, I think, about $1,500. Not that I would get uh, a 3D printer from Best Buy, but um, you can do that. All right, uh, and then if we uh, move on to the next process, um, this is, uh, I think, in the photograph here, there's a Z-Core machine, and this is uses um, a starch-based, um, basically like gypsum board type powder, and then um, has a build chamber, uh, powder supply, and then it has a uh, build envelope where you're essentially scraping powder down into a chamber, and both of those, uh, while well, one rises, one falls, and then it's essentially using um, literally printing uh, using an inkjet print head um, ink onto those layers of powder to build that up. And so you have, out of that, you get uh, incredibly high resolution. I think it's 400 DPI uh, in X, Y, and Z. And so you can get these really, really beautiful, elegant, and accurate models when you're going through that. Um, and the excavation process uh, is a, little like, a bit like an archaeological dig where you can come out through and then the extra part powder can be dusted off and recycled uh, and reused in the next process, uh, next print. Okay, uh, and obviously in here you can also do this in CMY color because we're printing the ink, we can also print ink at, for the color, so building that up as well. Uh, just going through some of the, the, some literature um, and the tooling book that was uh, Pamphlet Architecture has put out where you can start to see some of these things. Uh, some breakdown for this particular uh, system is uh, the models are extremely weak. Um, you don't want to drop them. You got to be really careful in the excavation process. Um, they're not particularly um, effective um, for anything other than visualization too. Uh, they're not performing uh, models. Uh, they're messy machines. The, like if you imagine, if any of you ever work with drywall, uh, anytime you start to cut into drywall, just powder gets everywhere. Um, imagine that on a scale of a machine that literally does that. You have to use an air compressor to dust off these models, so um, you need a clean space. These are very dirty machines. So the cost for this isn't excessively bad. I found that this is not um, not not incredible, not too bad, um, not too great uh, either. It's usually, I've seen it anywhere from three to ten dollars per cubic inch um, for this, so something to pay attention to. All right, uh, and so then the last process I'm going to talk about is a um, Ultraviolet resin cured through uh, laser systems, a Form 1. Um, this is something that started on Kickstarter. Um, it's a really nice machine. Um, this is probably the preferred machine. Um, if I had to pick one, uh, it's about a $3,500 desktop 3D printer. Um, I think they just released the Form 1 Plus as well. Um, but uh, essentially what it does is it fires a laser against some mirrors um, and those mirrors are focus or the, those mirrors and lenses will focus that and then it will um, print that up and then you have the tray rising out of this thing. So the effect is, of which is that um, this tray will rise out of this sort of primordial ooze um, and you'll have a 3D printed object out of that. Uh, Preform is the, um, the the proprietary guy that's been set up for this. Um, and here's some images that you get out of this. Um, so the finishing process, um, there's two different ways we can go about this. Is um, If we take the model out and break off the supports, um, which is relatively easy. The model is still usually flexible once it's done. Um, so you're going to take the supports off before you cure it. Um, then you um, give it a uh, rinse in isophenyl alcohol. I believe that's how you pronounce it. And then uh, we can go ahead and if we don't do that, uh, I didn't rinse this particular model um, for the just as, for the sake of seeing what happened. And this remained flexible for a little bit. I had I let it left it out in the sun to finish curing it. Um, and it uh, I, both of these models um, have. Are neither of them are tacky at this point. Um, this one ended up falling off the desk and shattering about six months after it was made. Um, but while it was uh, still going through the curing process, it was very durable. So, 
Uh, the breakdown, this is, uh, I don't know, this at the time of this presentation, it, this was a newer technology. I think new technology, it's an old technology, but uh, it's becoming newer to the market, um, which is to say it's a little bit more achievable, very high resolution. Uh, the, the Form 1 is measured in microns. Um, there's a really good strength in this um, with thicker prints. I found that, that you get a little bit more longevity uh, out of it with, with the other like sort of potato chip thickness that we had on that, uh, on that print. That really, I think, greatly affected this, the durability of that. Uh, it's not flexible, um, so I, I just you can take that out of the equation. They're a little bit flexible once you get them out of there, but as soon as you cure them, um, you don't want to do that. And like I said, the models do decay with time, and that's acknowledging that if you leave us out in the sun, they become very brittle. Um, and I have noticed, uh, actually, out of that, that they do start to, uh, if you leave them out for an extended period of time after six or seven months, uh, if you don't paint them or protect them from the ultraviolet light, I do think that there's some shrinkage uh, that occurs in that as well. So something to pay attention to. Uh, and so in that context, so that's all of the um, technology I'm going to talk about, some other resources that uh, you guys might find online. Um, if you go to shapeways.com, these guys do 3D printing. I'm not making a plug for, for them at all, uh, other than that these guys have a lot of materials and can print at uh, sizes that are generally sort of prohibitive, if we think about that. Um, and so... Uh, I use them to do things when I need something in a flexible format. Um, they do. They have laser sintering machines. They can 3D print in metal. Um, so if, if things get outside of sort of the realm of just a prototype or you want to do something uh, production, uh, this is a good resource that for you guys to be aware of. Uh, and there are other resources online. This is just uh, the one that I've used, so I can sort of vouch for it. But um, uh, like I said, there's a lot of stuff online. Um, Nervous systems, uh, you can use this system and uh, design this online. At the time that I was writing this, um, they act they were not previously connected, but now are connected with Shapeways. So uh, you can design your own furniture using algorithms and, um, and web interfaces. Okay. Uh, so those are some other resources that you can engage. Uh, we look at some of the rules for modeling. Uh, again, I want to repeat that this is going to be um, a watertight object. You're going to have a water balloon, uh, the concept if you don't have a distinct interior, distinct exterior, it's going to cause problems. Um, so if we're talking about Rhino specifically, and this is not, uh, and I'm just going to use some of the, the, the lingo in Rhino, but really the concepts apply and there's just different tools and other softwares for, for getting that stuff to, to port out. Uh, so Rhino uh, really is the best from my experience um, just because of the volumetric analyses and then making sure that uh, we can generate consistently closed mesh geometry. Um, I usually do all my checks in Rhino even if I'm in other softwares. Um, so you need, the idea here is that we need to generate closed mesh objects. Um, and so as a note to that, uh, you may have closed objects, but uh, that doesn't necessarily mean you have closed mesh geometry. Um, and so like that's, that's the first thing you want to pay attention to. And the other thing in terms of modeling, um, you can see by this slide, uh, is that you do not need to um, have all of the geometries merged into one super geometry. You can have um, as an infinite number of closed geometries. Uh, and I, as long as they touch or overlap, uh, you're going to be fine when you actually go and take that to print. Okay. Um, It'll also ruin your day, um, and I, I've, I've noted in here it, it's going to ruin your life if you try and get everything to merge. Uh, you don't necessarily want to do that. So, uh, and so if we see here, like this is a good set of geometries, even though these two things are are closed geometries that overlap. Okay, uh, so when you get in here, all principal objects will be defined by uh, surfaces that enclose a volume, uh, and so you. That implies that you should be able to do a volumetric analysis on that, figuring out exactly what that volume is going to be. Um, that's useful in, in pricing for the powder prints, not so much um, for the ABS plastic uh, or the resin prints. Um, well, maybe actually that's not necessarily true for the resin prints. That's accurate. Uh, but for ABS, you can like make a sort of a loose network on the inside of it, so it doesn't have to use literally every cubic inch for that. You can make them lightweight. Uh, so if we do a volume miniature analysis, uh, the first question over here is, are we good? And the, the answer is no. Uh, and so even though things appear to be um, all connected and touching and overlapping, um, if we turn on the uh, naked edges on there, we re realize that um, this is not a, a really good 3D printable object. Uh, and so when we want to go and run and check, uh, what you want to do is you want to turn on the show edges command in Rhino. Uh, and what that will do is that'll 
toggle on initially all the edges and you can set it to just show the naked edges and it'll show you whatever color you want um, where you guys can can see those things and and that'll enable you to start to articulate where you need to either do some model revision or if you just forgot to join some of the geometries where those holes are okay so when we model all those things up we're going to join those uh, into and I, you're going to go ahead and uh, I don't have that written here but you're going to join those into one closed poly surface. Uh, and then from there, what you're going to do is you're going to take those and you're going to mesh that poly surface. Uh, and depending on the complexity of this, um, is it going to increase your file size? Sky is the limit here. You can go very, very complex. And the more your polygons you use, the smoother your print is going to be. If I were to print this, you'd probably be able to see all of the, the little um, edges here and um, polygonal moments on that. All right, and so then once we do that, even though we've done a check for the poly surface, we want to make sure that we do a check for the meshes too, because um, if our, our modeling tolerance has not been set properly, um, when we go to mesh the object, it might actually rip the mesh, uh, which is uh, just something you want to pay attention to. So we're going to uh, select, deselect everything, type select closed mesh, uh, and then we should be able to select all our geometry. Alternatively, if you don't see everything, you can select open mesh and you can see where that's at. Uh, and if you have any open meshes, you can either go back and remodel some of those things or you can start to adjust some of those components. Um, and uh, if you go through this and you so like some really easy things to check if you just need to adjust this, you can just move this along this slider um, as you go through and check. And sometimes that'll be enough to, to get things within tolerance if you accidentally rip a mesh. Okay, once you've done that, you're going to take that and export this as a stereolithography file. Uh, and one, from there, you are now ready to print on pretty much every machine. Um, if you wanted to do a color print, I believe it's a VN, VRML, you can see that over here. Um, and that would be something uh, that you'd want to check and make sure that uh, you want to confirm that with whoever is going to be doing the 3D printing for you. Um, but you essentially will be good to go. Uh, so you can take that to the machine, uh, whatever interface that's going to be, and print that. And so all of the machines that's the standard format for is STL or stereolithography. Okay, so just going to repeat this one more time. Watertight objects, think in, distinct inside, distinct uh, outside. Uh, and so if you don't have that, you're going to create a big mess for whatever machine you're going to be on. Okay. All right.